Why are songs like that not written in our day? You know, most of the religious songs always begin with an I will. I will praise thee. I will something or the other. And that lets you know right off the bat that something's wrong. I remember I was telling Lynn, um, I remember Henry Mahan making the statement that great songs are born from great preaching. And there's not a lot of great preaching in our day. And you say, well, why is that? Well, I don't know. The Lord's in control of it. He's sovereign. And, and somehow, I suppose when I say, why aren't good songs being written? Well, if he wanted them to be written, they'd be written, wouldn't they? But still, when I hear a song like that, and I think of the stuff that we hear today, I think, ah, I wish more songs like that would be written. Turn back to Romans chapter 16. To God, verse 27, to God only wise be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. I love the way the writers to the scriptures were afraid to say anything except they said it through or in or by or for the sake of Jesus Christ. And he makes this glorious statement regarding God. To God only why. To God only wise. Be glory through Jesus Christ forever. Amen. Now I love the word only. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. To the only wise God our Savior. Be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forever. Amen. He is the blessed and only potentate. The only power. Power belongeth to the Lord. The King of kings and the Lord of lords. Who shall not fear thee, Lord, and glorify thy name? For thou only art holy. Who can forgive sin? But God only. God only wise. I love that. God only Wise. God is omniscient. That means he knows everything. He's never learned anything because he already knows all. He has never been informed. He has never responded to anything. He's never taken by surprise. He is sovereign. He controls everybody and everything. You know, I love when I'm preaching the gospel to realize that God is in control of the hearts of everybody listening. I can't affect you, but God can. God can harden you. He can make it to where you can't hear. He can make it to you where you don't even enjoy what you're hearing. Or he can make it to where this is the best thing you've ever heard in your life. It's him that does this. He's absolutely sovereign. That means he controls everybody and everything. And I can just rest in that. He's all powerful. That means whatever he wills, he has the power to make sure it comes to pass. He is immutable, he never changes, he's always the same. He's utterly predictable in that sense. 
I always think it's amusing when somebody says, I don't want to put God in a box. I'm not worried about you putting God in a box. You can't put God in a box. But he is as he is all the time, and he never changes. God is independent. That means he has no needs. He said, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell you. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. God is not worshipped with men's hands as though he needed anything. And he does what he does for his own glory. Everything he does, this is his motive behind it. For his own glory. Now, for any other being to seek its own glory would be wrong, wouldn't it? Because whoever it is, we owe everything to God. But it's only right for God to seek his own glory. Because glory is essential to his being. It's not essential to our being. But it is essential to his being. Why does God permit evil? I love this answer. Because he's all wise. That's why he permits evil. Because he is all wise. And it's the wisest thing for him to do. More on that in a moment. But wisdom. To God only wise. Wisdom is the right use of knowledge. And God's wisdom knows how to use his knowledge. He knows all things, and he has the wisdom to know how to use his knowledge. Aren't you thankful for that? Whatever's going on, God's in control of it, and he has the wisdom to make sure that it's the wisest thing that he considers, and he has the power to make sure it comes to pass. Now, I think of the wisdom of this book the very wisdom of God is in its pages. This book tells us that the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord and that wisdom is the principal thing. And Christ is personified as wisdom in the book of Proverbs. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth and it was by wisdom Yes, it was by an act of his sovereign will, but it was in wisdom that he created the universe. And this book tells us that he's God only wise. Oh, the wisdom of God. He's God only wise in creation. He's God only wise in providence. And he's God only wise in salvation. And you know, I talk about God's purpose and Creation, providence, and salvation. I use those terms quite a lot. And you know, I plan on continuing to do it because that covers everything. God only wise in creation, in providence, and in salvation. Now let's talk for a moment about God's wisdom. God only wise in creation. With whom did God consult when he created the world? Certainly wasn't with me or you, was it? We were uncreated. I love that scripture in Romans 11. Who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him that it might be recompensed to him again? For of him and through him and to him are all things to whom be glory, both now and forever. He in wisdom said, let us make man. I love the way he said, let us, don't you? Even then we hear of The Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Let us make man in our own image and likeness. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. I love this scripture. He's before all things. In creation, he's before all things. In providence, he's before all things. In salvation, he 
He's before all things. And by him all things consist. By him all things are held together. And you think of his wisdom in the creation of this world. I think of the physical laws that have been put into place in this universe. And yet he can suspend those laws whenever he wills to do it. Remember when the sun stopped and light was for 24 hours, so in the book of Joshua, uh, Christ walked on the water to suspend the laws of physics. He could suspend them when he wanted to, but they're his laws. And I think of his wisdom in creation. I think, I think of the placing of the earth just the right distance from the sun. Life can't be supported. Well, maybe it is. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I got my doubts, but that doesn't mean there's not life on other planets, but I sure enough got my doubts. But the earth is planted in the perfect place, uh, distance from the sun. You think of the atmosphere. You think of the moon and the, the, what effect it has on this planet, the tides and so on. You think of the sea and the teeming life, all of God's creation. By wisdom, God founded the earth. His wisdom is seen so clearly in creation. Everybody knows that somebody made all of this, and everybody knows that nobody made him. He's the eternal God, and we see his power and his wisdom in creation. But how his wisdom is seen in providence. Now remember, providence is everything that happens in time. There's nothing that escapes providence. Everything that happens in time is what he determined to happen. And that's why it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 28, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He is able to cause all things. Don't just look at that as a scripture that you've memorized, but think of the glory of this. All things, doesn't matter what it is, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He controls everything, and it's not difficult. He declares the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Now, people have asked for centuries, why does God permit evil? He's all powerful. He's all wise. Why does God permit evil? And for one thing, for a sinful man to make an objection concerning anything God does is quite foolish. When a man makes that objection, all of a sudden he becomes God's judge. And he says God needs to give an account of himself. Why does he let this happen as if he needs to give me or you any kind of answer? He's God. He doesn't know any man an answer. He's in control. He is not bound to answer any question. He's God. Why does God permit evil? I know the answer, though, because he's all wise. That's why God permits evil. He is all wise. He could have stopped the fall of man, and he didn't because he's all wise. You see, he and only he brings good out of evil. Now, the Old Testament example we're given is the life of Joseph. Joseph, the favorite of the father, Jacob. Joseph, the dreamer of dreams. Do you remember how he dreamed that all of his brethren were going to bow down to him? Now, how do you think that felt to them? You say, I'm going to bow to you? Yeah, I dreamed it. And then he went on to tell them, the moon and the stars are going to bow down to me. The sun's going to bow down to me. And they despised him in their hearts. They said, we're going to get rid of this guy, this, this daddy's boy, this father's favorite. So they sold him into slavery, had killed a, stripped him of his coat of many colors that his father had given him, 
and said, is this your son's coat? And Jacob said, yes, it's my son's coat. No doubt some evil beast has devoured him. How cruel to do their father that way. You know, the patriarchs, they were bad people. They were bad people. Every one of them. Apart from the grace of God, they were the worst people alive. You look at some of the things that they got into, but they served jo- they, they sold Joseph. Joseph is sold into slavery, and he, he, become, he, he becomes great at what he did. And the, the manager put everything under him. And lo and behold, the owner's wa- Potiphar, the owner's wife, said, uh, come lay with me. And he wouldn't do it. And she kept coming to him again and again, and he wouldn't do it. And finally, she accused him of, of misconduct and rape, and he was thrown in prison for something that he didn't do. What a horrible situation. He's sold as a slave. Now he's sold into prison. And uh, Psalm, I can't remember what Psalm it is. I think Psalm 78 says they hurt his feet in stalks. It was a miserable place to be. But he became the one the prison uh, guard trusted and, and everything that was done. He was the doer of it. The, the prison guard just gave him charge over everything. And he excelled in prison. Everything he did excelled. No matter where he was sent, he didn't you know, become negative and so on. He, he, he was a blessing there. And then he told the dreams of some men. And uh, they came to pass. He said, one of them is you're going to get your head cut off. And his head was cut off. And said, another one said, you're going to be restored back to your position of honor. And he was restored. And he said, when you're restored, remember me. Remember me. And, and remember that I told you these dreams. God gave me the answer regarding these dreams. So the guy gets out and he forgets him. He doesn't even remember him. Two years pass. That's a long time in a prison. Two years pass and Pharaoh has that dream. You remember the dream where he dreamed how seven uh, skinny ears of corn ate seven fat ears of corn and seven skinny cows ate seven fat cows and he didn't know what it meant. And he asked all the wise men of Egypt and nobody knew what it meant. And then all of a sudden, that fellow who Joseph told him about his dream, he remembered. He said, I remember my fault this day. And he told the Pharaoh about Joseph. So Joseph is brought out. Joseph interprets the man's dreams. You think of where he'd gone. He, he, he was a slave. Then he was in prison, forgotten left alone, and now all of a sudden he comes out and he tells Pharaoh exactly what those dreams mean. There will be seven years of plenty right before seven years of famine. And here's what you need to do. You need to oversee all the crops and everything so we got plenty of food. And Pharaoh made him the head over everything. He made him the most powerful man in all of Egypt to oversee the crops. Now during this time, those brothers who had sold him into slavery, they heard. The famine was where they were at too, and they heard. There's corn in Egypt. Jacob sent them to buy corn. But look in Genesis chapter 45. I could go on and on with that story. It's one of my favorite stories in the Bible. Genesis 45. Then Joseph could not refrain himself before all them that stood by. This is when he was before his brothers. He knew them, but they didn't know him. He cried, cause every man to go out from me. And there stood no man with him while Joseph made himself known unto his brethren. And he wept aloud, and the Egyptians in the house of Pharaoh heard. And Joseph said unto his brethren, I'm Joseph. Doth my father yet live? And his brethren couldn't answer him for they were troubled at his presence and you can understand why they were troubled I mean we sold him into slavery and here he is our life is in his hands they were troubled at his presence and Joseph said unto his brethren verse 4 come near to me I pray you and they came near and he said I am Joseph your brother whom you sold into Egypt now therefore be not grieved nor angry with yourselves that you sold me thither for God did send me before you to preserve life. 
For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years in the which there shall neither be earing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now, it was not you that sent me hither, but God. You didn't do this. God did this. To save many lives. Now, they did it. They did it with malicious intent. What they did was wicked to sell their brother into slavery, tell their dad some evil beast ate him so the evidence was gone, and they were so satisfied and so happy that they'd done this. And what does Joseph say? You didn't do this. God did. Now remember, everything that happens, God did it. Isn't there some comfort there with regard to everything that happens? I don't care what it is. God did it. And he is the only one who can bring good out of evil. And what good he brought out of evil right here. Look in chapter 50, some years later. Verse 15, and when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us and will certainly requite us all the evil which we did unto him. Now, remember this, as a man is, so he thinks others to be. That's what they would have done. And they're thinking he's going to do the same thing we would have done. And they thought he's going to get us now. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died. Now, before we go on reading, I don't believe that happened. I believe they're telling a lie. They're making up something. They sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil, and now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brother, brethren also went and fell down before his face. And they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, you thought evil against me. There's no question about that. But God meant it unto good. To bring to pass as it is this day, to save much people alive. You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. You see, God in his wisdom does what only God can do. He brings good out of evil. What is the most evil event to ever take place on our planet? You know the answer to that? When Jesus Christ, the Lord, was nailed to a tree. Now, is there any question that that is the most evil event to ever take place? What is the most glorious event to ever take place? When Jesus Christ was nailed to that cross. That's the most godlike thing God ever did. And you look at the good that came out of that evil event. Now that's God. He brings good out of evil. I love thinking about so many different things along this light. I think of how God used Satan to enter in to the heart of Judas to betray Christ so that Christ would be crucified. I love to think of Satan thinking, I'm going to destroy him. And he had no idea he was nothing but God's pawn in God's hand, doing God's will and bringing God's purpose to pass. He didn't know that. He meant it for evil. But God meant it for good to bring about the cross. You think of David's fall, how evil he was when he committed adultery, sexual sin with Bathsheba. And then to cover it up, he had Uriah murdered. And oh, the evil, there's nothing good about that except with what God did with it. 
what God do with it? Through that horrible sin that cannot possibly be excused, that's wrong as it can be, Solomon came. Who came through Solomon? The Lord Jesus Christ. And Bathsheba is actually mentioned in the genealogy of the Lord. Through that terrible sin, we got Psalm 32. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Through that sin, that terrible wicked sin, we're given Psalm 51. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according to the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgression. I think about Paul's thorn in the flesh. Somebody says, what was it? I don't know. But it had something to do with his flesh, didn't it? He called it a thorn in the flesh. And he said, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Who gave it to him? God did. For wise and holy purposes. And he tells us why. It was given to me, lest I be exalted above measure through the abundance of revelations. There was given unto me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, to beat me black and blue, lest I be exalted above measure. Three times I asked the Lord to let this depart from me. And he said, my grace is sufficient for thee. Child of God, your sin. Your sin. Though you meant it for evil, I'm saying this to the child of God, though you meant it for evil, it's included in that blessed verse, all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. He doesn't say all things except for sin. He says all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now how can that be good? I'll tell you one thing that my sin does. And I'm sure that this is true of every single believer. It lets me know that I have only one righteousness, and that's Christ. I'm not, I can't look to myself for a thing. I must look to him only at all times. You see, the elder shall serve the younger. The old nature shall serve the new nature. The old nature is going to be used to make you look to Christ only and nowhere else. And thus, God brings good out of evil. Only God can do that. And that doesn't... <clears throat> If somebody says, well, let's go ahead and sin then, so God can bring good out of evil. God forbid. God forbid we say or even think something like that. But thank God, he does always bring good out of evil because he's all wise. Don't you love the wisdom of God? How wise he is. If there were no sin... There would be no mercy, there would be no grace, there would be no forgiveness of sin. We'd never understand anything about the love of God. There would be no faith. What a beautiful thing it is to rest in Christ. But if there were no sin, there would be no faith. There would be no repentance. There would be no regeneration. There would be no seeing the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ if there were no sin. Because God is all wise. Everything he does is all wise. And you think of the wisdom of God in, listen, your sin and my sin is all our, it's all my fault. I can't blame God. I can't take comfort in the fact that God's in control of everything. My sin's all my fault. But you think of what your sin does when it makes you be merciful and gracious toward your erring brethren. What a blessing that is to just be enabled to be merciful and gracious and long-suffering and knowing that you're worse than they are apart from the grace of God. You really believe that. Oh, the wisdom of God. And lastly, how the wisdom of God is displayed 
in salvation. He made a way to be just and justify the ungodly. He made a way to punish sin and to forgive sin by the same act. Turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Oh, the only wise God. Verse 22. <clears throat> For the Jews require a sign. Show us a sign that will show us that you came from God. Well, he gave plenty of them, didn't he? But nobody believes because of a sign. If I could get up here and work all kinds of miracles, it would make anybody believe. He might be impressed with the miracles, but nobody ever believed because of a sign. Somebody only believes because God reveals himself to them. Nobody ever believed from a sign. But that's what the Jews require. And remember the Lord saying, A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh a sign, and there shall be no sign given it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. Three days in, three days out. And the Greeks seek after wisdom, philosophy, but we preach Christ crucified. That's our message. Christ crucified. The only way a sinner can be saved is through Christ crucified. All that's needed for you to be saved is Christ crucified. Your only way of entering the Father's presence is through Christ crucified. The only ground of your acceptance is Christ crucified. The way God can be just and justify the ungodly is through Christ crucified. The greatest display of the wisdom of God is Christ crucified. We preach Christ Crucified. Now unto the Jews, this is a stumbling block. You mean to tell me that my works count for nothing? Absolutely nothing? And that I'm saved by what he did? I don't believe that. I, I stumble at that. I, I just can't go that route. To the Jews, Christ crucified is a stumbling block. Well, that'll lead people to sin. You're not giving us a reason to obey. Why, well, that'll lead people to all kinds of works of disobedience because you say our works don't matter. They stumble at Christ crucified. To the Greeks, foolishness. You're going to tell me that God became a man? I don't believe that. You're going to tell me that God died on the cross? Why, well, that's crazy. You're going to tell me that you're actually justified even when you're a sinner by what Christ did on the cross? I don't believe that. That's foolishness. Verse 24, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. He's the wisdom of God to make a way for God to be just and justify the ungodly. And he's the power of God for him to be able to execute it in the first place. Look back up at verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it, the preaching of the cross, the doctrine of the cross, is the power of God. Now, what is meant by the preaching of the cross? Is it, does it just mean giving a description of Christ being nailed to a cross and talking about his physical sufferings and so on? Well, that's part of it, but it's literally the doctrine of the cross, the word of the cross, what the cross says regarding the character of God and what the cross says concerning the character of man and what the cross says concerning salvation. Salvation is utterly in what 
Christ has done. It's in Christ crucified. That's the preaching. That's the doctrine of the cross. The doctrine of the cross says man is so evil that when left to himself, he nailed God to a cross. The doctrine of the cross says when Christ said it is finished, everybody he died for, their salvation was accomplished. What a mercy that God in Christ said it is finished. Now that's the doctrine of the cross. To them that perish, it's foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it's the power of God. Now I love this next line, this, these next verses. For it's written, God says, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that, in the wisdom of God, The world by wisdom knew not God. It pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign and the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified. Unto the Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness, but unto them which are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God, Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. For you see your calling, brethren. How that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things in the world and the things which are despised hath God chosen Yea, and things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence, but of him are you. Who's the you? Those who are base, those who are despised, those who are nothing. Would that be you? You really believe that you have nothing to bring to the table. You believe that about yourself. Of him are you in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Now note these four things that Christ has made to every Foolish, base, nothing that he saves. Christ is made, Christ is made to that man wisdom. Christ is my wisdom. And let me tell you who a truly wise man is. That God would call wise. Someone who looks to Christ only as everything in their salvation. They don't look to themselves for a thing. They look to Christ only. God says that's a wise person. He's made unto us wisdom, righteousness. He is my righteousness before God. He's made unto us sanctification. He is my holiness before God. He's made unto us redemption. He's my full sin payment. And I am fit for fellowship and communion with this God through Christ being made these things to me. That, verse 31, according as it's written, he that glorieth, let him glory in God the Lord. Now to see the wisdom of God in all of this. This secures my salvation and it secures him getting all the glory in it. How wise. Truly. He is the only wise God. And to him be glory forever. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you that you are the only wise God. And Lord, how we thank you that your blessed Son is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption.
Oh, Lord, how we thank you. Lord, how we thank you for your sovereignty, that we're, your, we're in your hands. Lord, we wouldn't want to be anywhere else. How we thank you that our salvation is utterly in thy son and that everything you require of us, you look to him for. Lord, we find such security in him. Lord, we ask that throughout this coming week, according to your will, you would enable us to rest in my son and that you would enable us to conduct ourselves in a way that honors thy son. And Lord, we ask that you would open up doors for us to preach your gospel in this generation. Lord, give us a zeal to make known your gospel to every creature. Deliver us from a fatalistic and indifferent attitude, but cause us to proclaim your gospel to every creature. Lord, we thank you for the mercies we've had in this past week. We thank you for the Vacation Bible School. And Lord, we ask that you would be pleased to take the word that was spoken and bless it to the hearts of the young people. Now bless us for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen.